Okay. Okay. And um, so as people start trickling in, they can participate. And I'm going to um, get started with a few observations, like from, from the practice test. I want to go over a few problems with you. And then I'll open up to your questions. Uh, so today's Wednesday. I don't really remember what day of the week it is anymore or what month it is for that matter, but it's Wednesday. So for today, we should have practice test one and two done. Um, obviously, that's ideal, but at least today we're going to be discussing the material from the, pra the second practice test. And then on Friday, we'll discuss the material from the third practice test. So uh, for practice test two, um, it pretty much starts with the material that we started um, doing remote learning with. So all of these worksheets, um, you can access the old worksheets on Chem 101. Also, there are video lectures for these topics on this second exam uh, practice set and for three. So that one, that's kind of different from the first practice set. So for practice set one, you didn't have, that was in-person learning. So you didn't have the videos and, and all that stuff. And now this material in two and three is from remote learning. Um, and it's gonna start with kinetics and end with acids and bases. And I mentioned this in the last video where with acids and bases, I wasn't sure where to put it because it's a very, big chapter. It's actually, I think, three chapters in your book that covers acids and bases. Um, so it was kind of hard to, to put it somewhere. So I put it in this this practice set. So this practice set ends with, with acids and bases. And I had also mentioned that um, for your carryover into other courses, acids and bases are very important. Um, you're going to see that over and over and over applied to different fields, different contexts. So it's very important that you um, kind of understand the concepts in the, that chapter. So in, in teacher talk, right, that means you can expect questions on acids and bases um, on the final exam, right? There's going to be a few. And I'm trying to limit how much I put in, but you can expect acids and bases to be well represented is what I mean, right? So um, I looked this morning over the practice test of those of you who did it. Um, I'm really glad that a lot of you uh, got to work on, on practice test two. I have practice test three in front of me. I'm way ahead. Just hmm. I'm so ahead. I don't even have my practice test too. I grab this, and it's it's actually the exam, a copy of the exam. Okay, I'll have to look for that in a minute. Okay. How did I do that? Oh, here it is. All right. Okay, now I'm ready. <laughs> okay, so uh, I went over the exam and I saw a few that um, a lot of people were having problems with. So I wanted to go over those first. And then as I'm done with those, I have one, two, three, four, five, six from the test um, that I'm going to go over and then open to questions. And we're going to start with three. Um, once I'm done with practice, sorry, I'm going to start with practice test two. Um, once I'm done covering practice test two, we can review any other questions you have of practice test one, which we discussed on Monday. But I'm aware that I forgot to record. So hopefully the last half of this lecture will be for practice test one but I'm gonna start with two now. Okay, so for practice test two, um, like I said, it starts with kinetics, it ends with acids and bases. And I'm gonna start with problem number two. So problem number two, I'm gonna flip the screen here. Okay. 
and give me a moment. The girls have suddenly become fascinated with documentaries on Egyptian pharaohs. So we have, yeah, I've, I close my eyes and I see Egyptian mummies. So they're just right here watching their documentaries, which I'm glad it's not something like SpongeBob SquarePants or something like that. Um, okay. And if I said that wrong, I'm kind of proud I said that wrong. <laughs> now that I think about it. Okay, so uh, practice test two. Number two. So you should be seeing my uh, PowerPoint screen here. Oh, I forgot to connect my writing pad. Hmm, I thought I was on my game this morning. Okay, so here it, it's talking about constructing the expression for KSP. Um, so KSP is a K exp uh, an equilibrium constant expression. And remember that this is the problem, right? You don't include solids into KSP expressions. So in this case, when I'm writing my KSP expression, it's the concentration of products over the concentration of reagents raised to the power of coefficients. But in this case, you only include AQ and gases, right? So how is this going to look like? It's going to be products, which is this side. So the concentration of barium times the concentration of phosphate raised to the power of the coefficients. So barium is raised to the power of three, phosphate is raised to the power of two, and the reagent is a solid, so I don't include it. So this is my KSP expression. Okay, so I wanted to go over these rules really quick because I suspect that's mu what must have been the problem here, right? Remembering that the coefficients are the exponents right, these powers. Um, of these concentrations of the products for here. So all KSP expressions, right, because it's the solubility product, all of them are going to have a solid reagent. So in every single one of these KSP expressions, you never include a reagent in it, if you if you want to generalize, right. <laughs> What's going on, Ivana? It's doing exactly the same thing it did that other day. That's, I don't know. It's so weird. I know. Oh, that was number two for practice test two. Did you get it? Oh, you don't? Uh, I Emma? think it's yeah. number two on practice test three is what you just uh, did. Oh, no. Don't tell me that I prepped everything for practice test three. I might have done that. Hold on. Practice. Ah, fudge rockets. Yeah, I had exam three with me, so that's what I did. Okay, well, let's try here. No, this isn't going to work. Um, What can I do? What can I do? Let me see, export PDF. Let's try this.
Okay, sorry about that. So hopefully I'm doing a quick way rather than how I organize it usually, but I spent whole morning doing the wrong test. Just when I think I've got it all figured out. <laughs> um, so let that, yeah, here it is. Let me see how that looks. Okay, well, it's not ideal, but it's it's here and I can write on it so we can look at it. Again, I'm sorry, guys. Oh. We'll do the best we can. I've got something here at least. Okay. Thanks for bringing that up, Ivana and Emma. Thanks for helping. Okay. So now I do have exam two. It's going to look a little different, but um, it, I, it's still the same problems. I just copied the wrong test. Okay. Okay, so this should be it. When I, it's going to copy more than one question per page, but I'll fix it before I post it up. Um, question two and three was one of, was some of the ones that you guys had questions on. So let me make sure my pen works here. Yep. Okay, so now we're talking about kinetics. This is where the second practice test starts. And in kinetics, we're talking about speed of a reaction. And I'm going to start with number two, and then I'm going to talk to you about number three. So in number two, what is the overall order of the rea following reaction law? And they give you this rate law, excuse me. So the order refers to the exponents. So here A doesn't have a number, so you can assume there's a one here. And here in B, there's also no exponents, so you can imagine there's a one there. And then this number is two, so one, two, three, four. So it's fourth order. Okay. Okay. Uh, the second, this third question. Did you, Professor Alstadt? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can hear me. Yes, that's you, Ivana. Yay, good. Okay, what's okay, up? Okay, so for that number two, so really you're just, if there's no, like, charge, it's just one by itself, and then whatever Correct. the charge is. Correct, because remember, chemists are lazy, and we don't write ones most of the time, right? Because right? A to the one is just A. So if there's a, if A is there, it means it's raised to the first power. If And then any other number, we'd write it. Okay. Um, so if there's no number, it's a one. Perfect. Okay. Uh, what is the rate law for the reaction A to B if the rate constant is this at 75 degrees Celsius? So this is this is one of those things where in the last lecture I mentioned how you want to make sure, and I'm going to open the file here. Let me see if I can find it. Um. I was doing chapter, I've been prepping for Gen Chem 1, sorry, that's why you have all this other stuff. And handouts. And this is chapter 12? Yes. So on chapter 12, Probably this one. Handout nine. If you go to the very end, that's where we talk about the integrated rate laws. And at the very, very, very end, you have this sheet. And this sheet, I love this sheet. This is kind of your summary sheet. Um, and with this sheet, you should have this readily available as you're doing practice test two, but also when you're doing the final, because you can quickly refer to this to answer any questions from kinetics. Now, 
here it summarizes zero first and second order, which are the three orders that we discussed in lecture. And you could tell right here you have um, what the rate would look like, how the classic rate, the rate law, right? The graphs of the data, what they would look like, the integrated rate laws, the slopes of the integrated rate laws, like how you can figure out if it's second, zero, first, or second order, what the data would look like, half-life equations, and units of K. Units of K, right, are going to depend on the order of the reaction. So for a zero order reaction, you're going to have time, concentration versus time. For a first order reaction, you're going to have time inverse, right, per time. So this could be one over minutes. It could be one over hours. It's just one over time. And then the same thing here. For second order reactions, you always will have something that's like inverse concentration times inverse timer per, time, per concentration per time. And this concentration can be different units of concentration. This time can be different units of time, just like here, here, and here. And I made that clarification here. I'm using molarity in seconds as an example, unit of concentration in time, but it can be any unit of concentration or time. Okay, so in a question, when you start kinetics, you want to have the sheet out because a question like what we just saw, saying what is the rate law for a reaction A to B if the rate constant is 0.25, so K is 0 0.25 per molar per second. Now, it, I don't give you any other piece of information here, but I gave you the units of K. With those units of K, you can go to this sheet and see what are the classic units of K. And looky here, per molar per second is the unit of K for a second order reaction. So here, these units are for a second order reaction. So then when you're looking here, you're going to look for rate equals K times the concentration of reagent, right, A, raised to the second power because it's a second order. So I'm going to look here, and it's reagent, not product, right? It's always in terms of the reagent. So I'm going to look at A, it's, it's K, but A to the first power, right, K second power, and I don't know, right, this isn't even K. I don't know where this came from, so that's not it. Um, so this is going to be your answer. It's got K, and it has the square, and it's based on A. Any questions with this, que with this one, number three? Okay. Um, it's a different way to figure out the order of the reaction. Um, if you noticed, I did not include, I don't think I did. Let me double check that before I say that. Yeah, I did not include any of the problems where, oh, yeah, I did. This is it. Okay. I thought I didn't. What I didn't do is I didn't include those, like, tabulated ones that you have to kind of calculate at all of the steps one at one. Here, we're just figuring out the proportion of A to B, but this is an example of that. Um, you guys did really good with this problem anyway. But the units of K, right, are going to be also a good way to figure out the order of a reaction. Um, any questions with this section here? Okay, I'm going to move on to number 14 here. Number 14, given the following reaction, Okay, this is kind of a trick question. It says, given the following reaction, what is the molecularity? Okay, now remember, this is the concept. In this concept, we're talking about mechanisms. And in a mechanism, 
you can figure out the order of a reaction if you know the elementary steps. So it happens in one, two, maybe three steps. These are the steps that a reaction will follow to, until it's done. Now, if you just have the overall reaction, this is a summary of everything that happened from steps one, two, three, four, however many steps that mechanism has. Okay, this answers how the reaction happened. This is just telling you what happened. When it comes to the order of the reaction, you need to, and I'm talking about order of the reaction because molecularity has to do with order. Okay. When you're looking at an overall reaction, okay, you cannot predict the order of the reaction unless you have data. Right? That's an experiment like this one, where you have the experiment, you have the different data from number four and how it affects the rate, and you calculate M and N, which are the exponents. Okay, So just having the overall reaction, you cannot figure out the order unless you have data. The other option is knowing the mechanism. The mechanism breaks it down into elementary steps. These are all elementary steps. So in an elementary step, okay, the coefficient of the reagents are the order, but that's only in an elementary step. This is not an elementary step. This is the overall reaction. So you don't have the information to determine the molecularity, which, like I said, is another word for the order of the reaction. Any questions with this? I think that the confusion in this question came from thinking, not associating molecularity with order. If you just thought molecularity is, oh, there's two things, there's three things here, I'm gonna say it's term molecular. I can understand that that's an understandable mistake if you were not thinking, oh, this is talking about the order of the reaction. And the only way you could determine the order is either knowing the data or knowing the mechanism of the reaction. From the overall reaction, you cannot establish that order, which is the molecularity. Okay. I'm going to go on to the next one, which is 19. Here we are. The Habit process is this reaction, is an important industrial route for the production of ammonia. However, the reaction does not occur fast enough at room temperature to be useful. What can be done to increase the rate of this reaction the most? Okay, so this has to do, let me see if I can find that handout really quick. Um, here. Handout 11, when we talked about collision theory. And when we talked about collision theory, we said that a few things are related, right? K, a reaction can be fast. Hold on, let me get there. Okay. We talked about activation energies and how that's like the energetic hurdle that these reactions need to overcome. So they need to hit each other with enough energy that they can overcome or get up this, have enough energy to react. And so that has to do with K and K remembers the rate of a reaction. So the, the bigger the activation energy, right? The slower the reaction is going to be. Do I have someone with a question? Oh, sorry, my mic is still on. Oh, that's okay, just checking. <laughs> I can't see you guys, so I, I wasn't sure. I just heard a little feedback. Okay, 
Um, and then the shorter, right, the, the shorter the activation energy, the faster the reaction is going to be. So that's, that's speed of reaction. But we all know that thermal energy and chemical energy are closely related, right? Temperature is a way to monitor um, the energy of a reaction or how much energy we can provide. So at higher temperatures, the molecules move faster. Sorry, I said that a little weird. At higher temperatures, the molecules move faster and a great number of collisions can exceed the activation energy. So temperature, right, increasing the temperature provides the thermal energy for collisions to occur successfully. Okay, so in handout 11, I explain the relationship between collision energy, activation energy, uh, rate of a reaction, and temperature. So I'm coming back here. Now it says, how can we get to increase the rate of this reaction the most? So in that handout, we discussed temperature, but we didn't decrease the temperature. We want to increase the temperature. So we want to, this is not it, add a catalyst. A catalyst is a good way, and it's also on that handout 11, is also a good way to, to make the reaction go faster because you decrease the activation energy, right? A catalyst will decrease that bump so the reaction can happen faster. So this is a good option. Increase the temperature, that's a good option. So I already have two things that could work. Decrease the temperature and add a catalyst add a catalyst and increase the temperature. So that summarizes both of those, okay? Now, again, we're dealing with Chem 101, which is a different format than what I would usually do. Um, I would be careful to word something like this, the way that they, they presented it can be like, oh, you just picked the B and you moved on. So make sure you read all your options on Chem 101 because they do this quite often, okay? Just make sure you read all of it. Um, so this is number 19. I'm going to go to number 24. Okay. This says construct the expression for KC. Uh, for the following reaction. So this is why I got confused with the other exam, but this is what I was reviewing earlier, even though I was in the wrong problem. KC expressions, right, are equilibrium expressions. So that's going to be the um, Sorry, I lost track of my thoughts. Uh, I was looking at a different problem. Casey, uh, okay, products over reagents raised to the power of coefficients, okay, whatever they are. Now, the only thing is we need to remember you can include AQs and you can include gases. We cannot include solids and we cannot include liquids into equilibrium expressions. So thinking of that, our KC expression is going, to, we're going to look at our products first. This guy is a gas raised to the fourth power because that's the coefficient. I do not include nickel because it's a solid, so I don't include this guy over nickel, sorry. because it's a gas and there's no coefficient here. So it's like raised to the power of one, so I don't write it. So this is the KC expression for this reaction. You guys have any questions up to here? Okay, I have one more to go and then you guys can ask questions.
And this is in acids and bases. For acids and bases, I recommend that you have, so if you look on the PDF file at the end here, I wrote the equations that you'll need. And although you have the first, second in order for kinetics, I would still use that cheat sheet that I showed you earlier. And then here in the kinetic, in the bottom part, there's acid base equations and you're gonna need these, okay? These are really important. So you have the equation for pH. Oh, and just um, to remind you of something, I'm confused. On Monday, did we talk about practice exam one or two? Because I keep seeing problems for exam two. Sorry. Didn't we discuss the hydronium issue on Monday? Yeah. Yeah, I think we went over exam two on Monday. I think we went over exam two on Monday. Yeah. Gosh, I'm so confused. Okay. Okay. Let's just finish this, and then we'll talk about this in a We'll go back. This is in, okay, this is, yeah, because this is the second time I, that's what distracted me earlier. I'm like, I thought I talked about this problem on Monday, but Monday was supposed to be exam one. Was it supposed to be exam one or two? What are we doing today? Exam two. We did exam one on Friday, and then we started oh. exam two Monday, and then because so many people didn't get to it, we finished exam two today. Correct. Got it. So then I'm going to do exam three. On Friday. Minute. Or On yeah, Friday. Today. today, right? Okay. God, I got mixed up. Yeah. So I was supposed to start with exam three. I was. No, the, I, because, I mean, I thought you said you were going to finish exam two on Wednesday, but I don't know if you were going to start with three. I was, but I think I was going to start with three. So I okay. just got myself all tangled up. Sorry about that. But I'm going to go over this and then I'll, I'll start with three here in a, in a minute. Sorry. <laughs> Two, three, one, final. I just, mm. okay. So anyway, on Monday, we had talked about this problem. So um, technically, as a chemist, um, this is the correct way to express the proton for acids. This is what acids do in solution. And you know this because when HCl is in water, it produces the chloride ion, right? It loses that proton and... H3O. You never see this guy hanging out on its own. It's always associated with water or associated with the acid. It's not just hanging out in solution. But um, some educational resources think that this is easier for students to think of it this way. I don't think so because then I change it and I show you this thing here and you can't associate these two. So I'm not I'm not of that school of thought, but uh, Chem 101 expresses hydronium as the proton only, as this guy, instead of writing it like this guy. So when you're looking at the problems on Chem 101, they talk about calculate the concentration of this guy, but your equations all have hydronium because hydronium is what really exists. But the hydronium and the proton are the same, same thing, technically. Okay, so keep that in mind. Okay, so um, yeah, with that in mind, I think you get these because I think the my list was for exam three, not exam two. So um, sorry about the confusion. Um, I'm going to come back. Can I ask a question quick? Yes, I'm coming okay. back to you. Mm -hmm. So just what you said the h um plus that if we see that on chem 101 were to substitute that for the hydronium the h mm -hmm. okay three o okay yeah so because your equations on the text like on the handouts i never yeah. refer to h plus as the concentration of anything because technically that doesn't exist in solution you never see that as a chemist um but they are trying to simplify it. Again, I don't think it's good. I'd rather give you the right information from the get-go and have you know that, right, that H plus doesn't exist. It associates to water as hydronium. And so that's the way I taught it. And that's how my worksheets were built. 
Um, and then that way later on when you move to use it in another context, like balancing equilibrium equations and buffers and stuff, you're not thrown off by why is it hydronium now instead of just the hydrogen plus. So, but I, when I took the class, I remember they would teach it like H plus is, is the acid. But that's, that's why there's a difference. It's not incorrect or correct. It's just different ways of teaching it. Um, but all your equations are going to have hydronium. But Chem 101 is going to ask for the H plus, which is, so I just want to let you know it's the same thing. Okay. And sorry about the confusion. I just had one coffee this morning, apparently. <laughs> two is a magic number. <laughs> I cannot sit here if I've not at least had two coffees because this happens. So um, I'm sorry about the confusion. My intention was to start with three and then go on to two, but I got one, two, three, all confused and discombobulated. So, so sorry. Mm -hmm. um, no, nope. tell me. Emma. If we have, like, I have a couple of questions I just didn't really understand and stuff. Are we just going to go over them Friday then and just move on to test three or? Nope. If you, but hold on. Uh, so your questions are in exam two? Yeah. Okay. Let's do that then. If you have questions on exam two, since I already started with that, let's go on and, and ask and answer questions on two. Okay. What other question do you have for two? Um, 25 is the first one. Okay. And now I'm especially confused as why there's no PowerPoint for exam two. I'm so confused. Sorry. Okay. You said 25. Five. Here we are. 25. Is this it, Emma? Oh, wait. You can't see. Hold on. Yeah, okay. that's it. That's it? Okay. Yeah. The KP for the reaction is the... Oh, okay. So, okay, a couple of things. This question um, has a few things that are okay, but a few things that are not okay for you. So, I'll, I'll explain myself. Um, let's look at the differences between this reaction and this reaction. Okay, so what's the first thing you notice between this reaction and this reaction? What are the similarities? What are the differences? It's like half and half, I guess. Right, I think so. That's a good way of explaining it. Here A is a reagent, here A is a product, and here B is a product, and here B is a reagent, so it's flipped. Yeah. Right, so first the reaction is flipped. And then the second thing, and what you mentioned, the half thing, right? It's like, okay, so here there's two Bs, and here there's four, one, and two. So it's also doubled. It's doubled and it's flipped. Is that fair? Right? Yep. Okay, so then KP, right? Hold on. So here you have KP. And the reaction is pretty much the same. It's just been doubled and flipped. So KP for this second reaction is going to be doubled and flipped. Now, there is a couple things that are wrong with this question. On your handout, I did talk to you about what to do when your reaction was flipped. So the KP is the inverse of the KP, which is the same thing as saying KP to the negative one. But then when I went back, and I think Ed Omar and I were the ones discussing, he was the one that brought this up. I don't think we discussed um, about the doubling. That doubled means that you double the exponent or that you raise it to that power. So a problem like this, I would not include in the final. I can only include when in the final something where I flip the reaction, but not when I multiply it by a factor. 
So if a reaction is flipped, it's the inverse of the KP. Okay. Does that make sense, Emma? Yeah. Okay. So would you just, I here, so you just put the 0 0.0450 to the negative one, and that would just be the answer? Correct. You could do it like this, 450, or you can just use this on your calculator. Okay. I think Thank there's, you. let me see what it looks like. Yeah. So there's a, a button on your calculator, at least on mine, that looks like this. You can use that one too. It'll do okay. the same thing. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, any, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I have more. Oh, go for it. Um, hold on. 44. 44. I don't know why, but like, um, I got 43 right, and then I was doing 44 the same way, and I mm -hmm. kept saying it was wrong, but I don't know if mm -hmm. I'm just calculating out something wrong, or... I think I know what might be the problem. Okay. So, it's a very subtle thing here. Uh... So when you have, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about 43 and what you did right so that you see the difference. When you have HBr in water, right, this is a strong acid. So all of the hydronium is, all of this hydrogen moves into water and you end up with hydronium and bromide. And then you can get the pH because all of this, all 5.5 times 10 to the negative 6 molars of it became hydronium. So that's minus the log of 5.5 times 10 to the negative 6 molar. Is that right? Yep. Okay. But in this problem, they're asking for pH. And when you look at KOH, KOH in water dissociates to K and OH. There's no hydronium here. What you have is hydroxide. So all of this, all this 4.9 times 10 to the negative 6 becomes hydroxide. So the concentration of hydroxide is 4.9 times 10 to the negative 6 molar. But for you to calculate pH, you can't use hydroxide. You need to use hydronium. Does okay. that make, is that, was that the problem, Emma, or? Um, I think or not? so. Okay. Because if that's not it, if you did do this, and then yeah, I need to I look into Chem 101. It, like on, uh, I think it was Monday's lecture, like the whole hydronium situation, but I guess it kind of just. That's okay. When I was doing this one. That's okay. That's okay. It, now that you've done it, it kind of makes more sense, which is the yeah. good thing. So once you have hydroxide, you can calculate hydronium because of its relationship to KW. Yeah. And so then the concentration of hydronium is going to be 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14 over that 4.9 times 10 to the negative 6. And that number is what you're going to plug into here to get the pH. Okay. And also a good way to verify these things is when you look at this compound here, this is an acid, right? This is a base. So here your pH should be less than 7. Here your pH should be more than 7. Okay. If you calculate it using directly this value, right, you, what you calculated was the pOH. And that's not entirely wrong. You can still use it, but you have to subtract 14 minus the pH to get it. So there's more than one way to go around this. Um, my advice is pick one, like find one that you're comfortable with and go always with that. Um, but this is a good way to tell, right, that something's fishy. If you get, you have an acid and your pH turns out to be high or you have a base and your pH turns out to be low. Okay. 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 And go on, Emma. 
what other question did you have? Um, 56 is the last one. 56. Ooh, and that's a doozy. Yeah, I, these ones are just always so confusing to me. Like, yeah. I know, like, the first um, worksheet and stuff, we started doing these. I just never know what to put in yeah. the table. Well, I'll tell you something. I'm not going to include a problem like this on the final. Okay, thank gosh. <laughs> <laughs> because of what you just explained. Um, I yeah. was, I started working on the final yesterday, and it, I was just debating back and forth, but I'm not going to include a problem like this on the okay. final. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you still want to look at it or? Um, yeah, that'd be okay. really helpful. Okay. Let's go through this. So let me make it smaller so I can fit everything. I just want to know what I'm doing wrong and stuff. Oh, I know. And, and I'm glad that you're interested in that. Um, this I feel like this is a really helpful concept to understand. Um, so let's 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 move. Let's let's try to figure this out. So determine the pH of a 0.1 molar solution of this acid. Now this is an acid, and it's a weak acid. Okay, and I know it's a weak acid partly because it gives me a Ka. Also, it's not one of the six strong acids, right? So this is a weak acid. When we have a weak acid, the problem is HC3H5O2 in water. It does the same thing a strong acid does. It just does it in equilibrium. So that means that the product can reverse and make the acid and the acid continues to make the product. So it loses that proton and it makes hydronium. Okay, and this guy here is what I need to calculate pH, right? The hydronium concentration. So this is exactly the same thing I put on these ice tables. You see the reaction here with the equilibrium yeah. and then hydronium and the anion. So when I'm filling out these tables, liquid water does not count in my equilibrium. And so on ion chem 101, there's these dashed lines you can put in here to not count it. And then it says, determine the pH of a one molar solution. So at the beginning, this is what I have. Okay. And this is going to disappear by an amount. So by the equilibrium of the reaction, I have 0.1 minus X, right? Whatever I started with minus some that converted to product. And that's going to what, what I'm going to have at equilibrium. The hydronium at the beginning is zero, and so is the anion. But as time goes by and the reaction happens, this is going to start to appear by an amount, X. And this appears by the same amount that this disappears. Does that make sense, Emma? Yeah. Okay. So at this point, right, um, when I'm filling out this section on the ice table or on Chem 101, um, I need to make sure that I do not combine or simplify terms. And there is a part where you still have to write Ka expressions and Kp expressions and Kc. So it's still important to know this part. Um, x times x over 0.1 minus x. Okay. And so from here, you solve for your Ka expression. Now, you could do all the algebra, but I taught you a little trick here um, when we did these, and that's that most of the time the concentration of hydronium ends up being the same as the square root of Ka times the concentration of acid. I don't know if you remember this, but this was a shortcut to all the algebra. So if you have a weak acid, right, you can just do it this way. And then the concentration of hydronium is the square root. And then your Ka, which is 1.3 times 10 to the negative 5. And your concentration of acid, which is 1.00 molar. And this saves you all the algebra. And then you can calculate the hydronium and the pH is minus log of the hydronium. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, so let me save this file so I remember. This practice exam three. Okay. Any, uh, well, I guess I closed up the other uh, test. I want to move, let me see how we're doing on time. It's 10. Okay, so sorry for the confusion with two and three, but um, hopefully I've done a few questions on three, on two. Mm. <laughs> a few questions on two. Um, let's move on to three because I know quite a bit of you did complete number three. Um, so I want to go over that with you and then take in some questions. If you have time and you want to ask any questions that you didn't get a chance during this hour and you have time, we can stay on after um, 1020. If you have a class you need to go to, um, just on log and I'm recording this. So all of it, I'll post it on YouTube later so you can catch up. Okay. Okay. So uh, the, the list of questions I had or the list of ones I wanted to go over were for exam three. I just confused myself and it happens. Um, so uh, let's go over three and hopefully you guys have questions on three as well that we can go over. So present now on your screen. So on exam three, um, this was an issue uh, that I saw that I picked up. And so we discussed, right, that it's products or reagents and that you don't include the solid expression in your KSP. But then your exponents are the coefficients of the products. Any questions? This is number two of exam three. Okay. Wait, I'm I'm a little confused. So you're Sorry. doing, you do the the B A, and it would be. I'm, can you explain that one more time? Okay. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, yeah. Hold on one sec. Um. You can see my screen, right, Emma? Yeah. Okay. Just double checking. Okay, so. KSP is K, right, which is the equilibrium constant, but for solubility product, which means you have, with these KSPs, you're always going, sorry, that arrow is kind of jacked up. Um, you're always going to have a solid reagent in KSP because it's how well this dissolves or not. And in KSP, just like every other K, it's always going to be products, the concentration of products over the concentration of reagents raised to a power of the coefficients. Here, these are your products, barium and phosphate. So when you're writing KSP, you're going to start with your products. Okay, products are barium, barium ion. And there's three of them. That three is going to be the coefficient and the power of that concentration. Okay, so you raise it to the power of three. And then the other one is phosphate. And so this 2 is going to become the coefficient. I'm sorry, is the, the coefficient 2 is going to become the power of that uh, or the exponent of phosphate. And then you're supposed to write the reagents here, but this reagent is a solid, so you don't include it. So this does not go in there. So your KSP is your product raised to the power 
of the coefficients raised to the reagents if they're aqueous or gas, but not if they're solids or liquids. Okay. Yeah? Is that yep. better? Yeah, okay. thank you. Okay. Let's look at number three. Number three is a solubility product. It's a solubility question, okay? And here it's saying, what is the solubility of lead fluoride if the KSP is... If the solubility, it's giving you the KSP. So lead fluoride is gonna start, it's solubility, so it's gonna start as a solid. It has a KSP, so it's an equilibrium. Sorry about that, guys. It's at equilibrium. And so uh, the idea is that this ionic compound will dissociate into the ions that make it up. Okay, now the KSP says that this, right, 3.6 times 10 to the negative 8 is the equilibrium constant, right? And so for me to figure this out, I, I want to find out how much of this guy actually dissolved. That's what the solubility means. So if I were going to construct an ice table and I don't, this doesn't tell me how much is at the beginning, but I know that some of it dissolves and then at equilibrium, I have something else, but I don't know, but it doesn't matter because this is a solid. So none of the information pertaining to lead fluoride really matters because our KSP is not going to have it. Lead at the beginning is zero and the fluoride is zero. It appears as you add the lead fluoride by an amount I don't know what that amount is. But I do know that fluoride appears twice as much because there's two of them. So that's 2x. So when I write my KSP expression, it's going to be the lead ion raised to the power of coefficient, which is 1, times the fluoride ion raised to the power of the coefficient, which is 2. But I have a value of KSP that's 3.6 times 10 to the negative 8. Lead is x, fluoride is 2x squared. Now why am I going through this? I want to find out how much of this dissolves, so I need to find x. x is how much of that solid actually dissolved and made the ions. So I'm looking for x here. This is going to be 4x cubed, okay? So 3.6 times 10 to the negative 8 is 4x cubed. I'm going to divide by 4, and that gives me 0.5. Let me calculate it. Nine point zero times ten to the negative three six nine. That's x cubed. So I'm going to do the cube root on both sides. And x is 2.1 times 10 to the negative 3. So the solubility 
of lead fluoride is this number. Okay, any questions with this one? Okay, I'm going to move on to 14. 14 says to calculate the entropy, the standard entropy for this reaction. And it has carbon and two hydrogens. These are the reagents. And it's making methane, which is the product. And these numbers that you have here are standard entropies sorry, yes, standard entropy of formation. So when you're using these values, they're starting from second law entropies, right? Which mean that the entropy for the purest, simplest element um, is gonna be zero at zero Kelvin, right? So you're never gonna see a value, even in the simplest form, that's zero at 25 degrees Celsius, which is what this is for. So when I'm looking at these, just remember that the total entropy change, right? Change is always final, final minus initial. So it's gonna be the entropies of the products which is the final minus the entropies of the reagents. How do I get the entropies of the products? Well, I just add up the entropies, the standard entropies of the products, and then subtract to the standard entropies of the reagents. The product here is methane. So this entropy is going to be methane, which is 186.2 joules per mole Kelvin, minus the entropies of the reagents, which is carbon and hydrogen. But there's two hydrogens. So it's two times that entropy. So it's going to be 5.7 joules per mole Kelvin plus two times 130.6 joules per mole Kelvin. So this is the products. These are the reagents. And then the important thing is that I subtract them, right? Because it's the difference. That's what the delta means. OK, and when I plug this in, I get negative 80.7 joules per mole Kelvin. So in this case, right, the entropy is negative, right? So if this is for this system, right, the entropy change is not favorable. This is not a favorable reaction. So it's likely not spontaneous unless there's something else going on, like the enthalpy, right? So based on the entropy alone, I can't make that estimate. I have to wait till I know enthalpy and entropy. Sorry, entropy and enthalpy to make that decision. And that is delta G, right? But this means that the entropy of that system is decreasing instead of increasing. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm going to go through to 19. 19 is a similar problem, but it's dealing with delta G. Same thing, products minus reagents. These are the product, these are the reagents, these are the products. So when I'm looking at the delta G of formation, right, delta G is G of products minus G of reagents. G of product, this is the product. And 204 is 97.8 kilojoules per mole.
reagents, NO2, but there's two of them. So 2 times 51.3 kilojoules per mole. And so the product of that, or delta G is negative 4.8 kilojoules per mole. Now, delta G negative is a good thing, right? Delta G negative means that it's releasing free energy to the, the net outcome is free energy for the universe. So this is a good thing. So this reaction is spontaneous. Not that you had to answer that in this question, but right, that's how you interpret it. That's 19, wanted to go over 24 and 44. And then 24. What is delta G for the reaction? This, so three oxygen, molecular oxygens to two ozone molecules at 25 degrees Celsius if K is this. Now, in this chapter, in this unit, I gave you two equations. Delta G is minus RT natural log of K. And this is, it's just one equation, but I rearranged this for you where K is E to the minus delta G R T. So depending on what you're trying to find, if you're trying to find delta G, use this equation, which is what we're trying to do here. So K is given here, 6.1 times 10 to the negative 58. The nice thing about K, it doesn't have units, so you don't have to mess with it. I'm giving you R, R is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And the temperature is in Celsius, which doesn't work, right? So 25 degrees Celsius plus 273 is 298 Kelvin. So <clears throat> with this information now, you can substitute once you check your unit. So this has no unit, so that's okay. This is in joules and Kelvin, and this is in Kelvin. So your delta G will probably be in joules. Um, so delta G is negative 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin, okay, times T, which is 298 Kelvin, times the natural log of K, which is 6.1 times 10 to the negative 58. The trick here are the units. Um, just keep an eye out for that, right? Temperature needs to be in Kelvin, not in Celsius. Um, let me double check here. So then this delta G gives me 3.26 times 10 to the five. And this is gonna be in joules per mole. So I'm not sure, I didn't notice if Chem 101 wanted you in joules or not, or kilojoules. Uh, if it wants it in kilojoules, right, you just need to convert joules to kilojoules, but I don't remember. I didn't notice if there was a difference in the units. Um, so that's that one. And these equations, again, are going to be at the end of your, I don't know if I put it here in this one. No, it's not here, but it's on the PDF form. At the end, you have a summary of your equations. So these, this equation is there. Um, and then the last one I wanted to go over is 44. Okay, so let's talk about 44. 44 is a hydrolysis reaction, and um, let's talk about this for a moment. Sorry, electrolysis of molten KBr. So what happens is you have a beaker, and you melt KBr. So when KBr is melted, 
it dissociates, right? Ionic compounds, ionic solids dissociate into ions when you make them liquid, either by dissolving them in solution or melting them. So this is what happens. Now for you to do electrolysis, you need to connect your system here to a battery, to an external source that will force the reaction to happen. And this battery will force it by pulling electrons away from this side and pushing electrons towards this direction. Because this battery is pulling electrons, it's making this side a little positive and it's making this side a little negative. The source of electrons is always the anode and the one that produces right electrons is always gonna be the cathode. So the anode is slightly positive and the cathode is a little bit negative. Well, not a little bit, a lot, but depends on the reaction, okay? So in this solution here, doo -doo 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 -doo, you have your, your liquid KBr, you have ions of K and you have ions of Br. Now, this has a negative charge. So when you activate this battery, this bromide is going to see this positive charge and it's going to be attracted to it. It's going to be attracted to this side. Okay, do, 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 do. And then this potassium ion is a positively charged. And all of a sudden, there's this cathode with a negative charge. So it's going to be attracted to that side. So what's going to happen here is this anode, the bromide, gets close to this plate and the battery pulls away that electron and it loses the electron. But bromine can never exist as a pure element like this. It always exists in pair. So bromine forms like this. That means that two of these ions need to do that. So at the anode, two bromides are reacting to produce bromine and it does it by losing two electrons. This is what's happening at the anode. And at the cathode, right, when that potassium ion gets close enough, the cathode is pushing electrons. So it pushes an electron onto potassium and it makes potassium metal, right? Potassium solid. So at the cathode, it's pushing electrons. So the potassium is accepting an electron to make potassium solid. This too should not be here. And this is a gas. And this is a solid. And this is a Q. Okay. So this is the reaction that's happening at the anode. This is the reaction that's happening at the cathode. What species are made at the anode and cathode respectively? So if this is the anode, this is being made at the anode, and this is being made at the cathode. So I'm going to find bromine, gas, and potassium. Okay. Oh, and, um, mm -hmm. for anodes, there's always oxidation, and then for cathodes, there's always reductions. Um, yeah, the only thing that changes with electrolysis is that um, it forces, it pushes electrons to flow, even though. If you just had melted KBr, it wouldn't really be transferring electrons at all because the ions are happy how they are. The battery, what it does, it it, it just forces of uh, it forces electrons to flow. Um, so so that's what the difference is with electrolysis versus um, a galvanic cell. But yes, the anode is always going to lose electrons. It's always going to be oxidation, and the cathode is always going to gain electrons, right? And so that's the reduction. Okay. Now, if you guys don't mind, I need a minute because my kids are fighting. So give me.
It's okay, guys. No one's bleeding. Everyone's alive. Okay, so they're still fighting. Can you guys hear it or no? Yeah. You can? Okay. It's okay. It's okay. Don't worry <laughs> about it. Okay, so um, I'll just keep talking and hopefully hide the screaming, bloody murdering, blood curdling screams. Um, <laughs> apparently, they're not TV deprived as much anymore. Um, okay, so that was exam three. If you guys need to go, I understand that, and we can discuss exam three more on Friday. But I'm here, so if you guys want to talk or ask your questions now, I'm totally okay with that, too. Yeah, I have another question. <laughs> on three? Yeah, it's kind okay. of similar to the 56 one I asked before. Can we go over six, though? Absolutely. Which one? It's, uh, it's number six on test three. Number six on test three. It's very similar to the other one I asked you That's for help with, but yep. Let me see. I just want to make sure. Is it I the ice done. table? Yeah. Okay. They're Let's not very see. fun. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see what ice table it is. Okay. I'm trying, honestly, Emma, I'm trying to remember if I included this on the test or not. And I don't want to make that promise right now. Let me that's finish the, the test. Reason, yeah, that's like the only reason why I want to go over it, though. Yeah. Just Once I finish the test, something. which is my goal today and tomorrow to finish the final, on Friday, I can tell you for sure if I'm including something like this or not. I just haven't okay. gotten to this point yet on the final, so I'm not sure. That's fine. Okay. So... Um, let's go over it anyway, and then yeah. I, I'll give you more info on Friday. Okay. Okay, so this is the ice table, and you're term, trying to determine molar solubility. Uh, the nice thing when you have KSP is that this guy's always a solid, so you never care about the concentration. You're not going to have information on it. And so at the beginning, it's always zero. This starts to appear by an amount, but there's two ions of silver, of, yeah, silver, and one ion of the dichromate. So this is going to be 2x, this is going to be x. So when I'm filling this in, it actually kind of looks a little tricky because there's nothing going to be here. Nothing is going to be on the denominator because it's a solid. And then Ksp is the products, which is 2x squared and x. So this is what your KSP expression should look like. So from this to here is what the next step is, right? Oops, sorry. So <clears throat> this equation then tells you that 1.2 times 10 to the negative 12 is 2x squared times x. That's 4x squared times x, which is 4x cubed. So then 1.2 times 10 to the negative 12 equals 4x cubed. So I'm going to divide by 4. And I'm going to do, so that gives me, where did it go? This gives you 3.0 times 10 to the negative 13 x cubed. So cube root. Make sure you do the cube root and not the square root, OK? The cube root. is. 6.69 times 10 to the negative 5. Okay, so this is the number that goes in here. 
Okay. Okay. Because if you think about it, whatever dissolves here as X is really what you had to begin with. Yeah. So that's what, that's why X connects to this, even though there's nothing here. Okay. okay. Thank you. And again, I'll be able to give you more information on like if yeah. a problem like this, I just need to build it before I promise anything. Um, I'm inclined not to include them. I'm just, I don't want to make that promise yet. Yeah, that's okay. 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 All right. uh, and you said you had you. more? Did you have more questions? Or? Um, I am actually okay now. So oh, good. thank you. Okay. Right. Anyone else have a question? I guess I'm the only one here. <laughs> oh, you are the only one here. <laughs> I just finished the the me. I just went back and I'm like, oh wait. Mm. Well, thank you, okay. Emma, for keeping yeah. me company and asking questions. Of course. <laughs> I will. Kid situation. Oh my god, they finally stopped. It's just once they get started, it takes like a hose and yeah, physical intervention to get them to stop. But they're they're done. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to them. All but, right. um, yes, I'll, I'll finish building the test, and I'll give you more info on Friday. Yeah, that's fine. Um, that's fine. And you said, okay, so here's the deal with me. Mm. You're still recording. But Hold on, let me stop recording. Yeah.